Jeremy, you helped organize some of the witnesses for this hearing next week. You say it will be historic. Why is the military and the government not just being honest with us? Why are they overclassifying it? Why aren't they being transparent? UFOs have been a part of the human experience since before there was even a Pentagon or a Department of Defense. It was easy, and still is, to discredit a civilian. Uh, much more difficult to discredit a military man. But many of the reports come from highly, highly credible, technically trained people, you see. Convincing, I have seen confirmable no, evidence. Convincing. And We're done with the cover-up. And finally, I'm pleased the NDAA will include my amendment on increasing transparency on UAPs. And all of a sudden now, Congress and Senate, they realize they've been lied to. It leads me to believe that they are indeed hiding information. Commander Chad Underwood, he's the man that actually filmed the Tic Tac UFO. Commander Chad Underwood, uh, you know, the world has heard from you uh, once or twice before. Some of these phenomena, we know, have already had uh, an impact on our training ranges. Wouldn't it be neat if a journalist exactly like George Knapp had let's say a huge document detailing a lot of the blind spots that you might have just being the man that filmed the Tic Tac UFO, mm -hmm. an intelligence mm -hmm. report. George, would someone like you have something like that? I wish I could get a hold of that because if I did, I'd, I'd probably share it. With who? You know, Congress for one. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever gonna get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. This is weaponized, and uh, at the time that most of you will be seeing this episode, we're mere hours away from what we hope will be the first of many legitimate congressional hearings aimed at getting to the bottom of the UAP UFO mystery, and specifically about what our government might know, but has been unwilling to share. You know, a national security subcommittee in the House will be the host organization for this hearing coming up on Wednesday, July 26th. Representative Tim Burchett, is the ramrod for this event. He's joined by four of his colleagues, bipartisan, by the way. And Jeremy, you and I had talked to Representative Burchett about this, the importance of it being bipartisan. And it, it is a big deal, I think. Something that I think a lot of people in the UFO world who are not politically savvy don't really realize. But, you know, the congressman did make a point to reach out to some Democratic colleagues of his. They held a joint news conference, answered a lot of questions a couple of days ago that sort of set the stage for what's about to happen. What did you think about that that event? Yeah, Representative Burchett is a warrior for, for UFO transparency. He's learning as he goes about the UFO phenomenon and has seen stuff that the public hasn't seen, but he has stayed true to his word. That was our original discussion was, look, if I'm going to reach out to people, if you and I, George, are going to reach out to people, then what it, the people they want, then the deal is it's got to be bipartisan. And boy, did he pull through. But, but I haven't, we haven't been there yet, but you can tell he's made a commitment to that. I, I got to imagine you're in politics and you have completely different views than other people. And all of a sudden you're like, this one, we're on this together. I'm not political, so I don't know, but that seems like a big deal. It is a big deal because there's so little uh, in Washington these days on which you can have bipartisan agreement, almost nothing. I mean, you know, there's a lot of big stuff going on right now, which makes it all the more amazing that they'd have the subcommittee hearing coming up. You know, there are there are thoughts that they're going to shut the government down. There's disagreement about spending and budget and and just about everything. But on this issue, there is at least an appearance of bipartisan interest, both in the House and in the Senate. And that's pretty astonishing. We did we did hear from them during this this uh, event last Thursday that they are experiencing some pushback that there's been uh, opposition from within Burchett's own party, that there's been opposition from the larger committee and some of the staff, that they faced a uh, blowback from the Department of Defense, from intelligence agencies, he even ran into a little bit of a problem with NASA that we could talk about. But um, they made it very clear, I think, in this, that there, there really is blowback, that not only are they are their attempts to head off this hearing, but their attempts to intimidate witnesses, um, all kinds of things going on behind the scenes. 
from people who do not want this to happen. We've had a heck of a lot of pushback about this hearing. We've had members of Congress who fought us. We've had members of the intelligence community and also the Pentagon. Even NASA backed out on us. There are a lot of people who don't want this to come to light. That is absolutely correct. And I'm going to walk a, a fine line right now. It's not my story to tell or, or yours, right? This is, we have to walk a line here. But look, there are great interests to not have this information about UFOs be public. We know that to be true. And you can look at it from the point of national security, weapons of mass destruction. But you, you can also imagine that there are financial interests that people can keep what they have kind of thing. So the infiltration of that can go all the way from the top of Secretary of Defense all the way down to, to staffers that have been compromised and trying to torpedo and sabotage the work that, that some of us have been doing just to have people's voices heard. So that is a real thing. I was looking at you know congressional Twitter compared to UFO Twitter, and dang, it's as nasty as UFO Twitter with the lies and the obfuscation and the trolls. It's pretty crazy. You know, we all, of course, have already heard gripes from UFO world about the witnesses who are lined up. Three great witnesses, by the way. And, you know, we've ah, we've already heard from those three witnesses. That's old news. And there's one uh, prominent debunker critic skeptic who whined that, quote, you know, the world has already heard from Fravor and Graves countless times. Countless. Let's count them. Let's see if we can count them. I mean, Dave Fravor spoke to you and I. He spoke to me at KLAS. He spoke to, with us, we interviewed him at McMinnville uh, because we twisted his arm. He spoke to 60 Minutes, and I think maybe he spoke to CNN, but I don't think that's countless. We just counted him. Uh, I, you know, uh, we, we we spoke to him behind closed doors. We believe he spoke to Congress behind closed doors a couple of years ago. We know that uh, Ryan Graves is a terrific witness. He's he's done way more media appearances than, than Dave Fravor has. But that's part of his the organization that he set up. He's actively recruiting pilots who've had experiences and wants them to come forward and share information. But he, neither Dave Fravor, nor Dave Grush, nor Ryan Graves, none of the three of them have ever spoken in a public hearing before Congress um, about what they know. I mean, this is different from giving an interview to 60 Minutes or the New York Times or to us. It's different. It's a different setting. You're giving an interview in front of Congress on the record to the world, to the whole Under world, oath. to the entire. Yeah. About UFOs. And it's it's much weightier. It packs a punch. It was not easy to get to Dave Fravor to do this. And you can tell that story. Um, I'd love to hear what he's learned since we heard from him in 2017 about the Tic Tac encounter. What's happened to his life? You know, what else has he learned since then? Has there been pushback from the Navy? Has his has his career um, suffered any consequences as a result? I'd like to hear that stuff. Well, we'll have to get him on to talk with him at some point, but yeah. You know, UFO world is going to gripe no matter who the witnesses would have been, uh, given that that's what they do. Uh, you know, an alien overlord from the planet Meepsorp could come into the house chamber and, and lay his bony three-fingered reptilian hand on a stack of Bibles and be sworn in and someone in UFO world would complain, well, why couldn't we get any of the alien Nordics uh, instead of the reptilians? You know, somebody gripe about it, wouldn't they? Yeah, but like, I, I love UFO world. These are my friends. I mean, the, the griping, I get it. That's a very small minority of vocal people who try to twist the truth with mental gymnastics, obfuscating the, the reality with, with absolute disingenuous intent. I, I don't even care anymore. This is so much larger. The world at large has not heard in this setting, hopefully, and we pushed for it, under oath. Everybody wants to be under oath. We have Lieutenant Ryan Graves. Now, some people are saying, well, he didn't see a UFO. Well, hold up now. Hold up. I have had private conversations with him where he was like, I was, it was on my radar, solid lock. It was on the ASA, shared by everybody. We have it on multiple systems. One of the things about UFOs is low observability. Sorry, that sucks. That's one of the things. And so he is a very powerful witness. He, look, he's a good human being, first of all. He's an honest individual. He's doing great and excellent work for transparency and for the, the rights of, of, the, of the pilots and putting themselves in danger when they're going to war 
and even flying in these training ranges now that we know there's so much issues with these things. So Lieutenant Ryan Graves is a badass Patriot American hero. He's got something to say, and you got to listen to him. And he does have direct firsthand experience with the UFO thing because they are on his ASA and he visibly can't, he's hunt. He, he told me in confidence, I spent the gas, not in confidence. He told me I spent the gas and tried to hunt it before because we could see him right there. Couldn't catch it with his eye, but all the people coming in reporting to him from the red rippers continuously every day. They're seeing them cubes, man, with spherical auras, cubes. And by the way, this is not new. When I was on Joe Rogan's podcast, I pulled up something, I think from the 50s or 60s, talked about cubes with spherical auras. This is something that's been going on a long time. This is not Lockheed Martin with the new Black Project. And I'll put that article in here somewhere. It was easy to, and still is, to discredit a civilian. Uh, much more difficult to discredit a military man uh, in Blue Book, for instance, we would get reports from military pilots. And that was particularly embarrassing to the Air Force because after they had trained those men, and they couldn't very well, they could say that a civilian pilot might have been untrustworthy, but they could hardly say that to their, of their own military exactly. pilots. And we got case after case after case from military pilots, which never hit the press. There are th three things about this whole thing, Tom, that no one can deny. They're, incontrovertible points, even the grossest skeptic can't deny them. First of all is that the UFO reports not only exist but persist. See, when I started with the Air Force, I thought that this was a fad. In a few years would just disappear. All over. Okay. And it's global. We have reports now from 140 countries. I mean, as many, practically as many countries as there are in the United Nations. And the most important of the three things is that many, unfortunately not all, but many of the reports come from highly, highly credible, technically trained people, you see. Also, you have Commander David Fravor. And now, George, we got to be honest with the world. You kind of gave me a tip and a nudge when I was hungry. And you're like, go after this shit, right? So, you, you know, that is how it happened. You told me there's a story here. See if you can open this. And, and man, so we did, we did together. And what I think about Commander David Fravor is that he is top of the top. He is the top gun. You can hear how Commander Underwood was kind of revering him. Here's a guy you got to listen to who didn't just see a UFO and he didn't just chase a UFO. He, he, he didn't just chase a UFO. He engaged UFO. He went after it, man. He circled down, tried to get it. It noticed him, popped up came up and, and showed him its power and ability and like that to his cap point. Additionally, something I, I hope we get to hear more in Congress, because in the first talks I had with everybody, especially with Commander Fravor, there was something under the water. Now, the question is, what was it? Remember, he said it was cross-shaped. In the first interview he ever did, ever, right, he talks about it. That was on my show. He talked about it, right? So I want to know, what has he learned since then about that? Like you asked. And then finally, David Grush, this is the big question. This guy believes in UAP, UFO transparency. He believes in talking um, truth to power. If he's asked the right questions, how far is he going to go with what he knows, not with what he thinks? I've heard people complain, well, he didn't ever see anything with his own eyes. It's all secondhand information. That is not the case. Uh, there are limits on what he's able to say publicly, but I, I think we can safely say that that is not the case, that he does have firsthand information and he has a lot more information than he's made public uh, so far. And so well, it'll be really interesting to how, see how Congress goes after it. Right. Well, firsthand information can be a lot of different things, right? So David Grash definitely didn't go walk up and touch a UFO or nothing like that. He's never claimed that. He has, does not have that kind of firsthand information. However, if he's able to talk about the things from the classified sense, but in a way that it can be public, I think the world is going to learn a lot. I understand the frustration of people who follow the UFO topic, as well as anyone. You and I not only engage with folks on a regular basis, but we want the same thing they want. We want it all and we want it now. Um, you know, we'd like to have the the Roswell bodies and the Roswell craft as exhibits at, the, at this hearing or as some future hearing. But it, it does take time to do this stuff. And, and more importantly, what I, I think the, the UFO public doesn't realize is that the general public is the real target audience here. Those are two different groups, the UFO public and the general public. The UFO public is already uh, educated to some extent. They know what the Wilson Davis memos are. 
They know about Roswell and Socorro and some of the most famous cases, but the general public does not. You recall earlier this year, we had three UFOs that were shot down and people paid attention to it for what, two days? And then it was like, oh, there's a Barbie movie coming or they went back to their lives and just dropped it. Those who paid attention didn't stick with it for too long. The general public's knowledge base is a lot different from the UFO public. So having Dave Fraber, Ryan Graves, Dave Grush, as your start off witnesses to establish a baseline of information, that's a step they need to take. Uh, also, this committee really needs this to go smoothly. They have to have credible people who were trusted by their government with credible testimony. I mean, you know, we heard from Tim Burchett who said he had opposition to this hearing within his own party, within his own chamber. He had opposition from the Pentagon and CIA and contractors who spread a lot of money around on Capitol Hill. A lot of powerful folks don't want this to happen. So he needs this to go well. And, and if it does, as I said, establish a baseline of information, then there can be more hearings. Then they can get into further stuff. They can bring other witnesses who can, who can break new ground. But you need to have a place to start for the general public. And I think these guys that they've got lined up is a, are a great trio to start with. Yeah, and look, if you're listening on Tuesday, less than 24 hours, baby, we're going to have it. So I'm excited. Uh, look, man, I am really excited for what's going to happen, and I agree with you. This is so that we can get on the same page. If we get on the same page about the basic facts, the basic truth, not some sort of alternate reality we each have that we try to understand. If we get on the same page about the facts and the truth, then we're going to start understanding more about the UFO reality, what it means, right? So I'm really optimistic for what's coming with this hearing, George, and it's really fun. I think you and I are in the same boat. We're going to be there and just really pumped to hear what happens. Well, I hope to be there. I'm going to try. We'll see. Um, I would say this, though, uh, back to Dave Fravor. I think the Tic Tac case, the Nimitz Whatever, whatever label you want to give it, is the most important UFO case of all because it was so well documented, because it was central to that New York Times story and to reporting that we have done that have basically, you know, the things that have happened over the past five years have flipped the script on the UFO issue. Now you got mainstream media take, paying attention to it. Congress is paying attention to it. And I think without Dave Fravor's credibility, without the video and the other testimony from other uh, Navy personnel, on the Nimitz group, we would not be this far. That key case is key. So which is, you know, we we can't talk to Dave Fravor before Congress um, convenes this hearing, but we can talk to one of his colleagues who was also there uh, on the day of the Tic Tac incident. And you know who I'm talking about. I am. This is Commander Chad Underwood. Commander Chad Underwood was actually deployed and ordered by Commander Fravor saying, this is where it went to was the cap point right after I engaged it. Get out there with your camera and film that thing if it's still there. And sure enough, he's the WSO, which is the weapon systems officer or operator. And what he did was he went out there as the backseater. He found that bad boy because it's on everybody's radars and bam, he filmed it. He flipped through a whole bunch of different modes. I think we can hear from him right now. Let's bring him in. Commander Chad Underwood, uh, you know, the world has heard from you uh, once or twice before, but it's been a while. Yep. And um, Jeremy mm -hmm. and I are curious, how has your life changed, if at all, since all this news broke five and a half years ago? Yeah, qu quite a bit, actually. Um, it, it, you know, the incident, obviously, as you know, is in November of 04. And until up until, uh, you know, five years ago ish it, it's it's been like there was nothing like it was just nothing of of my personal experience or anyone else's and then uh, i saw the interview with uh commander dave fravor and so i called dave and i was just like hey man what is going on with this and i was like how did this resurface and he goes yeah you know he told me kind of the the gist of it and we we talked for quite a while because it had been a while just anyway and then uh he he said, uh, you know, if you want me to get you in contact with uh, some other folks out there in the media, if, you, if you're willing to do it, you know, and you're willing to let me use your name in association with this, so you're not just some entity out there. Um, I was like, yeah, sure, man. You know, there's no problem with me. You know, granted, I was still officially with the military, uh, serving in the reserves, but I've since retired a couple of years ago. So I could be a little bit more flexible with what uh, my words are. So I don't no, not technically speaking for the government, 
um, anymore. And then um, once I talked to Dave and I talked to a couple of the other players involved with uh, the Nimitz uh, occurrence, um, it's been, you know, uh, podcasts, uh, getting in touch with Jeremy and yourself and uh, um, seeing all the the um, the press and, you know, Pentagon hearings and Senate hearings and things like that, uh, congressional. And then, um, you know, people kind of one by one started telling their sharing their stories. I was like, oh, crap, there's really more out there than what I saw. And uh, I was thrilled to death to hear that to just make me, you know, feel, you know, loony or crazy. But uh, it was quite a dead zone there for quite a while from from the t- shortly thereafter the incident until it kind of just blew up um, like it has in the last five years. or You so. recorded the images, the images that have now been seen all over the world. And no matter where this mm-hmm. UAP inquiry goes, whatever the public interest is five years from now, that's history. You have a role in in history and, and by securing <laughs> those images. Right. I suppose so, George. Um, it's I never, never really thought about it that way until uh, uh, to hear your enthusiasm and, and talking with Jeremy on various occasions. I was like, well, I guess it's a bigger deal than I kind of thought it yeah. was. And uh, uh, I, I've, not that it validates anything from my own personal, you know, ego or anything like that. But it, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. I don't, I don't mind it at all. And it's. Uh, if you're going to be enough for something, it may as well be something like that and not do, you know, something way worse that I probably pulled off while I was in the Navy. <laughs> let me be uh, let me be really clear with our audience. Commander Chad mm-hmm. Underwood, he's the man, you're the man that actually filmed the Tic Tac UFO. You're the one mm-hmm. that went up there, went through the various different modes of visual, mm-hmm. of, of thermal, of, of all of the sensor systems that are intimately linked to your weapon systems, but you're the one that captured the imagery that the world has put all over the news. And and I have a bunch of questions about that, but before we get serious, I know that the first time you ever went on camera was with me and we did an interview. I remember Mm -hmm. that, so cool of you to trust me, bearded guy with tattoos, (laughs) I get it, but we've become friends. So through this experience, I I need to kind of get at you a little bit first. I okay. learned why it's called the Tic Tac UFO. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to blow yeah. it for everybody. I want you to tell us why are we calling right. a UFO a Tic Tac? Can you please tell us the story of that again? It's a little, yeah, it's it's it is kind of funny to think about it, even in retrospect. Um, I'm a big fan of kind of the slapstick comedies of the the 80s, you know, uh, airplane, police squad, naked gun, etc. Um, I just I just love it. That's 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 the kind of thing that makes me chuckle every single time. And I just watched Airplane, you know, b- way before we organized this interview uh, last week. And I was just, you know, I, I get into it. I just love it. And I, you know, I'll watch like, you know, the the YouTube documentaries on the making of that and all that stuff. I just love it. And there's a scene in that movie um, that there's a, a an aircraft that's in kind of, you know, distress. That's uh, airborne, and uh, the pilot and the uh, the ground personnel are talking, you know, communicating back and forth of how we can best resolve this situation. And um, you know, of course, there's comedy; just it's nonstop. And um, I guess the 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 press the press representative, I think his name is uh, Johnny or something like that, and he's talking to the press corps who are asking him questions. You know, like you know what what type of plane is it, and you know what uh, where was it headed, blah blah. blah. And uh, they were like, describe what it looks like. You know, it's a big, shiny white plane with wheels. And he goes, it looks like a big Tylenol. And I knew when I went back to uh, the intelligence center and was asked to describe what it is that I saw, I was like, I, I don't know what it, I don't I have no idea what it was, but it looked like a big Tic Tac because I thought if I said it looked like a big Tylenol, then I, I wouldn't be taking it as seriously as I probably should have. So thankfully I, I had better discretion and said, I, it looks like a Tic Tac. Little did I know that those two words would come and still kind of uh, define most of my uh, adult, you know, for you know, late thirties and early forties. Um, many years later, so we could all be saying the Tylenol UFO. Commander uh-huh. David Fraber engaged it, but now, but now the world at least is saying Tic Tac, and you thought that was better. That's amazing. 
I, yeah, I, I I think it's hilarious, actually, just the amount of attention that that phrase has gotten. Like, why did he call it Tic Tac and things like that? So I just wanted to glad to set the record straight now. If anybody <laughs> doesn't know the scene in the movie, go watch it. Maybe we'll put it in the yeah, episode, but right. it's it's just hilarious. And and that's something you and mm-hmm. I kind of bonded on early. Like last night you were watching National Lampoons again, you know, yeah. vacation with your kids. So look, man, I think a lot of people putting a face to it is really important. And Mm -hmm. and that's why we're having these hearings coming up so people can hear directly from firsthand direct witnesses. George and I played a big role in getting that set up to have people that you worked with there. Um, I would like Mm -hmm. to talk with you and and George, maybe you can take it from here, but I'd like to go through the experience. A lot of things have been said over the years, (laughs) like that the object, the Tic Tac didn't zoom off, that that's a camera artifact. And I would like you to educate the audience on things like did the Tic Tac vanish at extraordinary speeds or is that just an mm-hmm. optical lens thing like people are trying to say online? I'd like to hear from you what your personal experience was radioing back, you know, to I believe it was the, the Princeton making sure did it did it really go? So can you just right. George, maybe you can take it from here. Let's go through the facts as people need to okay. know them to be educated about this. Sure. Uh, Dave Fravor, Commander Fravor, gets back from his flight, and uh, we're putting our gear on as he's getting ready to um, go debrief in uh, his flight, which is just landing. And he turned to me and he said, uh, "Yeah, my call sign is nuts." And he was like, "Hey, nuts, um, there's something weird out there, and I want you to kind of check this out and see if you can't bring it back on 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 the FLIR pod because he didn't carry a FLIR pod on his jet at that time, and uh, he knew that I was." And so uh, I was like, you got it, boss. You know, I take that as a direct order. You know, if it was just another one of my junior officer buddies saying, hey, go check this out. I've been like, okay, yeah, if we come across it, then it's fine. But, uh, you know, we, we've got to conduct business as usual. But when your commanding officer tells you something like that, you you better listen. So we get airborne, um, do, do some of our pre, you know, administrative portions of the flight. And then we break off and we go to our respective cap points um to conduct some um very kind of low stress uh air intercepts and um i get this uh the princeton talks me onto a target that's uh, a bearing in range off my nose and uh, i see a blip on the radar so i went and locked it up and all the sensors on the um on the aircraft on the on the super hornet all what's called they, they do what's called slave to that uh that particular contact because you've made it the highest priority in your in your target list and so uh you know i double check that the the recorders are on because i was like okay this this could uh, i think this is what uh, dave was talking about and sure enough you know i, I step over to the uh, uh the FLIR pod that and make sure that that's going to be on film and um sure enough it was uh so I went from radar, you know, radio communications to the a radar lock to a FLIR lock. And that's where you see the video um, that has uh, been known as the Tic Tac video. So we get a lock and uh, you see like there's auto acquisition bars, you know, that, that uh, show up, you know, it's kind of like two kind of vertical lines that show up on uh, either side of that contact. And this thing is not exhibiting any sort of flight qualities that you would find in a typical or conventional aircraft of you know, a helicopter or a fixed wing, um, anything. How so to the so, people that, that don't are not familiar with this? How so? What does mm-hmm. it mean that it doesn't look like anything else you've ever seen? Right. It, it didn't it didn't have any of the typical characteristics that I'm used to seeing in aircraft identification through the FLIR pod. So typically what you would see are um things that look like a conventional aircraft airplane. You see a, a, a nose, a tail. Um, a, a vertical stabilator, stabilator, and um, uh, but the biggest kick, the biggest thing was uh, there was no exhaust plumes. And a FLIR, all that's really doing is tracking heat and contrasting it against its background. So that's what lights up, and you would see on a even a commercial airliner, it's putting out enough heat that you'll see that that plume of heat, um, like it's exhaust coming out of the back of the aircraft. You would normally see that, but didn't see any of it. And so it was just literally just this this thing kind of just floating in space, you know, just not it wasn't moving. It wasn't, um, you know, Dave brought back the evidence or his testimony that it, 
it was aware of him and kind of engaged him in some way when he got in, you know, within visual range that never had, it never got to that point with us. And so I was like, okay, this is, I think what Dave is talking about. And, um, it correlates with what the Princeton was passing along to me. So I was like, okay, I have pretty high confidence that this is the contact that I want to take a look at. And so I was like, okay, if anything, I, I, I don't know what it is. I'm not going to be able to identify it. I don't even want to make a guess at that point. But what I want to do is just bring back as much video evidence as I could to let the heavy brains in the intelligence center help me figure out what this is because I'm not going to be able to solve this calculus in real time. So I'd start going through um, the different fields of view. So you start off in like wide, wide field of view. And then it gets, yeah, I can go down to like medium field of view, narrow field of view. Uh, both in IR, which is infrared, so it's contrasting heat, and well as EO or electro-optical. It's basically a TV. You're looking at the TV, a black and white TV screen of what it's, you know, that, that's where you see like the, the polarities changing with a, 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 a bright white uh, contact against a darker background and then vice versa where the, the background is lighter and the Tic Tac itself is darker. And so I just wanted to bring back as much of that footage to give as much information to the, uh, the the intelligence folks of what it is that's out there. And at this point, I'm just kind of being a forensic investigator. I, I'm not, you know, a detective here to, you know, solve that problem. I just want to bring back the evidence. And um, so uh, towards the end of the video, you know, I think it's going through a lock. I think at one point it, it tries to like, uh, it attempts to break lock it. So you kind of see like those vertical lines kind of separate a little bit. And which means the the uh, the FLIR pod is kind of widening its its field of regard, and then it, it snaps back to the the tic tac. And okay, the the tar the the uh, the target lock was not lost. And right there at the end um, of the video, the tic tac video, you see it kind of break that lock and dart off to the left. Um, that's not going to happen um, by a glitch in the system, if you will. Like it's it takes a lot. I mean, it's just, it's a you know. At the time, I think it was a six or seven million dollar pod. So it, it's it's not it's designed and engineered to keep those tracks. I mean, I should theoretically be able to turn my back to the tic tac and then turn back around, and nothing is lost. It should it should know exactly the piece of sky to look for and to find this contact. If you even if I were to like turn away from it and turn back into it, like it's that calibrated, that high. So level. people argue that what appears as a dart off to your optical left on that screen mm -hmm. was the change of a lens and that that's what's making it dart off. But you actually did something right when that appeared to you visually. And I think this is so key to people understanding, you know, f compared to people that are just trying to argue a false case. What is it mm -hmm. that you did when you saw that that proves to us that it did dart off as you saw with your eyes? <laughs> Well, it goes from a, a high confidence lock. So you see the tic tac, and on each side of it is a uh, those two vertical bars that I mentioned, and that's that's very high confidence um, in that in that track. And for it, the tic tac to exhibit that kind of speed capability, uh, instantaneous speed, if you will, to be able to break that lock and zoom off the left side of the screen, that's that's not a system malfunction. That's that's what's that's what happened. At the end of the video, we see, we see it appears the object shoots off to, to our left. Is that indeed what happened? Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. And so uh, even, you know, if people want to argue that, oh, you changed modes and like that doesn't change, all that changes is what's displayed to me. It doesn't change the lock um, that's that I've taken already. All it's doing is just looking at it from a different perspective. Because your your weapon systems rely on the fact that those optical things that you're receiving, uh, that, 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 that remains consistent without break, just from an orientation of a lens, you, you couldn't have that happen or your weapons would not be able to target it in the same way, if I understand it correctly. But is that is that correct? Yeah. And you did something else. You did you or did you not call in and ask where did it go? Well, I just contacted the Princeton. You know, first of all, first thing I was trying to do I was trying to reacquire. I was like, maybe it you know just darted off of my scope to the point where I couldn't. It was it wasn't in the field of view of those 
of any of my sensors. And so, you know, I, of course, you know, bank the aircraft to the left and turn in its direction of where, you know, it, it was clearly going and nothing. And so uh, it just wasn't there. It, you know, I, I went through all the short range radar mechanics, all the different ways that I should be able to find, reacquire this uh, target uh, from my own, you know, from my own cockpit. Once I could, once I had about, I don't know, five or 10 seconds of just no contacts on my screen, it was like it, it never happened. My radar scope was clean and my FLIR pod had nothing on it. So I radioed back to the Princeton and I was like, uh, uh, something to the effect of, hey, is that contact still there? I've, I've lost contact. And they're like negative radar contact. Um, you know, and this is, but you know, maybe they haven't had time to process. The Princeton hadn't enough time to process of like, okay, getting a new radar, kind of a clean slate. Be, okay, all right, let's take another sample of where it went. And I told them, you know, hey, it, it went off to it went off to the my left. You know, I probably used a cardinal direction at that point. And uh, do you see anything there? Because uh, it zoomed to the left of my nose, and they're like, no, negative radar contact, and. That's more or less the end of it um, from the flight perspective um, during you know real time when it happened. So so the the object from your perspective did mm -hmm. instantaneous. It was, was your word move to the left. Yeah, I, I would say I would in, I would say with very high confidence that's exactly what happened. What happened when you land? What what happens to the the data that you bring back? You've heard the stories. Men in black come and mm -hmm. scoop it up. You've got a secret 17 minute recording of it. What happens? Well, uh, we come back, we land. Uh, you know, first thing I want to do is go back down to the ready room. Um, I've still got all my gear on at this point. I, I was like, you know, in my commanding officer, Dave, he's, he's basically standing right there. He's like, tell me you got something. I was like, uh -huh. I just showed him the, it's a little eight millimeter <laughs> tape. I was like, let's check it out, boss. <laughs> And uh, so we saw it. He, he, I think we made a couple of copies of it just to kind of, all right, no one's going to take this from us and have us, you know, steal the steal our moment. You know, whoever we end up turning the originals over to is, you know, at that point, it's all locked up in a safe anyway. So it's it's not like it's going to get out in the open. And so I go that back down to the intelligence center to give my official, you know, kind of debrief of the flight. And uh, by that point, Dave's uh, kind of encounter had become. Uh, part of the rumor mill, if you will, and rumors spread pretty quick on a on a carrier, especially within the air wing. And uh, so we go down. I go down to the intelligence center. Still got my gear on, of course, because this is you know that's just what you do. And um, uh, I remember one of the one of the other junior pilots from my one of my sister squadrons is down there. He goes, "Oh, did you see a UFO too?" And I was like, "Right here." <laughs> and he, he's like, his face is. He he just kind of turned white as a ghost. His jaw just kind of dropped, and then so we popped it in uh, the the playback machine. Uh, keep in mind, these are, these are old older eight millimeter tapes, so just kind of like your old VCR tape, just a smaller version. It's not like these solid state drives that we have uh, in use now. So I turned it over to them, make sure that they got what they wanted. Um, you know, they're asking, this, this is where the story of the the tic tac nomenclature came to be was uh just kind of answering just basic questions and uh because the evidence is there you know i was like okay your head you know we could basically recreate it on a, a dry erase board of like where i was where it was and you know it's it's elevation it's it's azimuth uh in relative to my nose of the aircraft and which way it darted and um kind of recreate it you know, in a very rudimentary dry erase point, dry erase marker uh, perspective. And then so uh, that was it. I mean, we, I, I turned, I was like, you guys got any more questions? And they're like, no, I mean, I don't really know if they knew what to ask. Um, but it, uh, and keep in mind, we're in the middle of workups. We're very, very busy. I mean, we're keep, we're putting in, you know, 20 plus hour days and you know it's you don't have time to kind of just sit down and and uh uh investigate this thing to its level that probably needs the you know the attention with which it needs and so you know it uh 
I'm sure uh, Dave has mentioned uh, that there's what's called an air plan cartoon or an air plan um, that has a, a, a little cartoon strip on it. It's a daily thing. It's basically the Air Wings master flight schedule of the, uh, the events for the next day. And so, uh, and the and the and the cartoons always designed to kind of poke fun at people and you know make fun of your bosses and things like that without fear of you know repercussion. And um, for the next, I would say two days, it was kind of like you know Men in Black, and uh, of course they you know that's what the ships rolled on closed caption TV was uh, the Men in Black and Independence Day and all those kind of uh, UFO oriented uh, movies of that time. And um, and I was like, okay, fine, yeah. You, you know, guilty as charged. And uh, it made for some interesting uh, discussions, you know, at, di at dinner, sitting around with a, with a bunch of your buddies. And um, to be quite honest, George, after about two days, maybe three days, it just went away. I mean, we were just busy. We, we had to move on to the next thing. You know, we did our job, got the evidence, whatever they do it from there, do with it from there is over my head you know it's beyond my pay grade somewhere along the line you heard this point about the, the cap point this thing you won't believe it it mm -hmm. went to the cap point right and also somewhere along the line you learned that the radar guys kevin day and his colleagues had been picking up these objects for almost two weeks I, I, yeah I, I did hear about that explain, after explain the what, before you answer i don't you know, for the typical person, what is a cap point that George is talking about? Okay. The cap point is the combat air patrol point. It's um, so if you're going to go, it's basically a, a, a kind of a, a, a stake in the sand of like, OK, the good guys are going to, you know, set their formation here. The bad guys are going to set their formation at the red. cap. We call it red cap and blue cap, blue being good guys, red being bad guys. And so we set up, a, you know, we say, you know, dealer flight is set set on cap. We wait for the response. You know, we get a fights on call, which means okay, it's time to it's time to go through our scenarios and uh, intercepts. So they're basically just starting locations of where you're going to start your training. The fact that they had been tracking this for a while kind of surprised me, and I was like, okay, are we talking like you've been tracking it for a day, day and a half, two days? They're like, no, it's been a couple of weeks. I'm like, uh, you didn't feel like. <laughs> relaying that to the air wing at all, you know, seeing how we're the ones that are, you know, potentially going to be in the same piece of sky and we have high optic, you know, very good optical systems and sensors and record things that we can record, you know, the fact that they kind of waited two weeks kind of, it didn't make me mad. It's kind of, I just found it very puzzling. I'm, why would you do that? You know, it just kind of didn't, didn't jive with me very well. Commander, you've heard all the discussion, public discussion, the debunking efforts mm -hmm. in the years since yeah. the Tic Tac was become, became public. It's glare, it's flare, it's seagulls, it's a commercial airliner mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, mm -hmm. traveling away. Can you address those in general? I, I guess it mm -hmm. would seem to me if I were in your shoes, I'd be kind of insulted. There you are, the best aviators in the world, the, the real life top guns with the best equipment yeah. in the world and people mm -hmm. who have never flown in, in those aircraft are telling you what it really is and you're completely mistaken. I would listen to two people, you know, two uh, types of people when it comes to that. It would be the, the, the fellow air crew, the aviators and the engineers that actually designed the pod and say like, OK, what could this possibly be? We, we couldn't really come up with a definitive answer. Uh, we I, I'm much better at te telling people what I what I know it's not. Um, and it's kind of you know, it's like. You know, it's people that oh, it's a it's a smudge on your camera. I'm like, no, that doesn't that doesn't happen. It's you would have seen that anywhere. You know, um, it was uh, you know this or that. I'm just like, no, you know, it it wouldn't it wouldn't have behaved that way. And um, you know, and I, I've never I've never ever said what I actually think it was because I don't know. And I, all I can do is to, to the debunkers. I'd be like, well, I can tell you what it's not. Or just people that ask questions in general, I can tell you with very high confidence level based off of experience um, what I know this thing isn't. And by that, you know, we could probably rule out, you know, quite a bit, you know, if you want to plug that into an algorithm somewhere and just be like, have it, you know, hit uh, search and it, it would it would probably make the Internet barf. You know, it's just like it just wouldn't know what to do with it. And so it's, um, you know, I'll I'll leave the debunkers to debunk. That's just what they do. And um, I, 
not, I wouldn't say insulted. I was just kind of like, no, well, you're kind of bringing a, a knife to a gunfight. You know, I, I just don't do that. You know, well, it seems like so, it's be insulting to me because we've seen it on so many other cases where people who have never mm -hmm. had those jobs, never work with that equipment, yeah. have to assume right. that our equipment stinks, our sensors are bad, and our best trained pilots don't know what they're talking about. Exactly. That, that's the part that's kind of insulting to your point. Yeah, that's right. And especially, you know, once we um, started getting evidence from the East Coast Bubba's, you know, that they're I was like, OK, now this is this is up in the game, you know, because they their sensors are uh, they've gone through a couple upgrades compared to the a generation of aircraft that we were flying. Um, same airframe, just high upgraded sensors um, and, and things like that. And so uh, to see other occurrences um, on the East Coast and then uh, uh, th that's been oh, it's kind of validating. It's like, OK, you know, this is not this is not me just talking out of my took us. You know, this this actually is this actually happened. I know. I mean, what I have no reason to embellish any of it. It just it, it it's all there on the tape. All I can do is just describe what's on the tape and where we experienced it you know, what we experienced at the time. Yeah, Dave Fravor told us a number of times he'd really like to fly one. I would assume you would too. And mm -hmm. I would also assume that you're glad that they are not overtly hostile because, you know, you yeah. look at that technology, it is technology, right? What they could do, yeah. it'd be pretty amazing. Darn right, I would like to see the inside of that kind of, you know, cockpit, whatever whatever it is. Um, but, uh, you know, one, one last thing is, uh, uh, you know, some you know some people have said like, oh, it's probably some black project, um, you know, covert project being conducted by government agency, three letters, or uh, you know, some defense contractor that's operating with uh, specialized kind of uh, clearances. If that were the case, I mean, carriers operate in waters that are scheduled months, if not maybe a year in advance. I mean, you can't really shift those because you're coordinating an entire battle group, which is not just an aircraft carrier. It's the whole kit and caboodle all together operating as one. You can't just schedule that in a week. You know, that takes a lot of time and a coordination. And if they were going to conduct some sort of, you know, some covert project, we, would, we wouldn't be told like, okay, this is what we're testing because we don't need to know. All they, all they need to know is, all we need to know is like, hey, from this time to this time, this is a no-fly zone, even for military aircraft. If you if you see these things, this is you know, ignore it. You know, we've scheduled this range from this time to this time, and then we're going to be out of there. And that's just kind of how the test that test operates. Um, in my you know limited experience in that world, it's, let's just say, for instance, just out of, I was just thinking about this earlier. Let's say it is a black project. If I were a contractor, you know, working for you know, whoever or a, a government agency, and it was a black project, the best distraction would lead the public to believe that it's a UFO, you know, and lead them down that path. It's out of our world, you know, and just kind of be like the best, you know, it's, a, it's a, just, it would be a nice distraction for them, you know, that's just be kind of spitballing. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's important from a number of fronts, but I think the public, um, availability to have, to see this information and and kind of get some transparency of what these things are and what we've experienced and um i think it's really important and people are people are not people are never going to stop being interested in this kind of stuff as long as they keep happening and the sensors and the aircraft are only getting more more capable and you know of more of higher fidelity it's only going to get more and more detailed you know i i consider my my uh, footage to be kind of rudimentary when you compare it to the, uh, you know, the East, some of the East coast guys that are getting, you know, some of the rotations and the, and the, the go fast, you know, across, you know, skimming the water. I mean, that's, that's legit. Like that's, that's pretty, that's pretty sweet, you know, from a, just a per performance standpoint. <laughs> so, so a few things, I got a bullet list of things that, that you said that we I really want to nail down. So you have confided in me, I think the first time, we ever, you ever did an interview, you told me that you have encountered a black project before and you had to do that debrief and it looks very different. This wasn't that because you know that mm -hmm. process. So you have mm -hmm. encountered black project and had to do that debrief. That is not the case with the Tic Tac, correct? Yeah. Unrelated to the Tic Tac. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So basically um, if you see something, 
or you fly into a piece of sky that's in a, uh, um, let's just call it a test range in the greater Nevada, California area, you can do the math. If you penetrate that airspace, um, you're instantly told to go home and, uh, um, and there'll be someone to meet you when you, when you land. And, uh, uh, they don't describe all they just say is, okay, what'd you see? You know, you're, you're essentially under oath because you, you could be, you know, you get yourself into some trouble there. If you kind of had footage that you didn't intend on taking that they want, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so you, you get, you, you're kind of sat in a room, sat in a room that's, you know, kind of a smallish room. You're just kind of like, um, am I going to make it out of here? You know, like what's going on here? And then, you know, a couple guys in uniforms or, uh, is usually a uniform person would come and say like, uh, you know, they'll describe to you, uh, this is project X, you know, just fill in the blank of whatever the project, it doesn't really matter. And, um, they don't tell you what it is. Um, but this is the project that you, that you witnessed. You shall not speak of this ever again. <laughs> and you basically, it, it didn't happen. You know, it, it's it, erase it from your memory bank. You and know? that did not happen when you filmed no. the Tic Tac. No. Okay. So the other thing people say is that there's longer footage. And I know you and I have talked a bunch about this. Can you just tell the world again, because they're forgetting is there some crazy longer footage to the to the Tic Tac UFO that you you know that you filmed that you're just not releasing to the public? No, what you see is what you get. Um, uh, yeah, because we, uh, you know, in the Super Hornet, you could only record like the left and the right display. Uh, the right display was your radar, and then the left display was I had my FLIR on. And you flipped through every setting you could to accumulate as much visual and and elementary data that you could get mm -hmm. to bring back to the you know engineers and people that would mm -hmm. an analysts that would be able to look at that. But something that Commander yeah. Fravor has said to me many many times, which is that the quality of what you brought back and filmed when you filmed the Tic Tac UFO, mm -hmm. the quality of that was better on the big screen and that there was appendages on the bottom two l-shaped appendages is that how you recall it what the resolution was was higher than what um you know has been put out there in the public it, um not that it's it's still it's still correct but you know it's still a bit more detailed but not to the point that it would make me think it's you know clearly something well, that i can define or identify. what drives me crazy is if you noticed, and I think George and I noticed it the most, which is that when they admitted that this is anomalous, it's not a known craft, there's no transponders, mm -hmm. we'll get a little bit more into the technology of that. When they admitted that and they turned around and they said, okay, we're going to drop it now to the world, the Department of Defense. All they did was drop the, the video we had already provided to the public that was already out there mm -hmm. in the public. And it wasn't mm -hmm. higher fidelity. They didn't go get the source material. They just re-uploaded the footage that was online. Did you notice that, George? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great that that's that's the sleight of hand thing that we're we're seeing. So three more questions uh for from me right now. I think mm -hmm. it's really important people understand this. We talked about this. The object you filmed were calling the tic tac UFO because you have a love for comedy. There was something called passive jamming and active jamming, mm -hmm. and you experienced mm -hmm. one of those two on that day. Can you explain mm -hmm. to people the difference and what you experienced and why that's important? Active jamming is when I call it offensive jamming. It's the same thing. So offensive jamming would be uh, the target aircraft jamming your systems. It is actively jamming you, right? And you get indications on your radar screen. And then you, when you see the tic tac, when you see the 99.9 in the flare in the flare screen in the upper kind of right quadrant, those are indications of jamming. Uh, we got indications of jamming on our radar, um, which again is probably not gonna be seen for a while, um, sadly. I mean, it, it wouldn't be too tough to declassify it, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know where, I don't know where the, you know, the, the powers that be stand on that. But you get these indications, these vertical lines of uh, along that line of bearing of that uh, contact, 
that it's you're being jammed and you also would normally get um what kind of jamming okay what band what radar bands are being jammed that's the part that's very classified um, because there's there's certain little frequency bands that is jamming and um you know and we do it you know in training quite a bit and you're technically not supposed to do that in peacetime environment passive jamming is more so you're not really doing anything if you're just being jammed and without any sort of uh um provocation if you will but active jamming is a, it's a completely different animal so it's it's concentrating radar it's concentrating energy from its jammer on my aircraft that's offensive jamming and uh we don't really tolerate that in peacetime yes yeah, so, so what we've talked about before is that what you're seeing then is a craft of mm -hmm. unknown origin mm -hmm. It is mm. technologically advanced enough to actively jam your optics mm. and weapons systems in a peacetime operation. That's a problem. Mm. You once said to me and Commander Fravor said to me that that could be considered or would be considered an act of war if it was like yeah. a Russian plane or something like that. Oh my God. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. I wanted to bring every single mode and zoom that the FLIR is capable of back to the carrier so we could analyze this thing because I'm not gonna be able to solve this problem in real time. It was offensively jamming us just outside international waters in peacetime operations. It's an act of war and we're gonna go out there and make you pay for that. Especially in 2004, like this stuff would not have existed. And um, certainly it wasn't a US unacknowledged black project or even an acknowledged black project. If anyone assumes that it was a, you know, let's just say China, Russia, you know, are, are kind of big uh, threats out there that have money and projects, nothing to describe as that kind of technology that could have acted in that way. Commander Fravor said that he could imagine maybe in 2004, you know, there's stuff he doesn't know, but he says, this is 17 years later. So to keep that technology secret, he said, would probably be almost impossible for 17 years. Right. That's why he's saying he's leaning more towards this is not ours. I agree with that. I, I agree completely with that. I know we don't have it, that technology, and which means that China and Russia, th there's no way. Right. And, and that they could just do what Commander Fravor uh, described, you know, the the up, down, left, right, you know, um, the way that it acted on the surface and the way that it acted, you know, getting airborne, that just doesn't, that doesn't happen. And like I said, like the, that was my weirded out moment was when, you know, he described it and then I saw it and, and then it was just like, okay, where, where do we go from here? So this idea that there's a technologically advanced object craft that it can perform in ways your craft can't, that it can actively jam not only your radars and sensors, but your weapon systems. You once told me that could be misconstrued as an act of war. The, that 99.9 .9 is just indications that you're being actively jammed. It's your radar that's being jammed. Okay, there's a big kind of a nice distinction there. It's kind of the whole active versus passive thing. So the active jamming portion of that is, um, it was offensive in nature. And um, you, okay, we we can jam each other, blue versus you know friendly versus friendly in a training type of environment. But we're we're really restricted on the frequency bands that we jam. And then once we go into combat, then we go to what's we load what's called the war reserve version of those jammers. And those are the jammers that jam. Um, you know, surface air missile systems, air to air, um, air to air aircraft uh, uh, systems, and uh, things like that. So it was jamming my radar, which is the only way you can really employ weapons at that point. You can't just you can't employ weapons on just a an optical only. At least at that point, you know, things may have changed, and I, I don't think that they have. It's definitely eye opening. Um, you know, more after the fact, because um, I didn't really, you know, I was so junior at that point, like I didn't really realize the rules of engagement forbid you from actively jamming uh, folks because we do it all the time in training, but we're, you know, we're just 
jamming certain frequency bands that uh, aren't going to, you know, fry your 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 buddy's systems or anything like that. Because that's ultimately what you're trying to do is defeat, you know, kind of defeat and fry the radar so it can't actively employ weapons. Your friend, your colleague of many years, David Fravor, is going to be one of the three witnesses mm -hmm. appearing before the subcommittee this week. We've heard people groan, mm -hmm. ah, guys, that's old news. We've heard Dave Fravor tell a story before. My, my take mm -hmm. on it is it is different from Dave or any of the other witnesses telling Jeremy and I something or speaking to the New York mm -hmm. Times or even 60 Minutes, sitting in front of Congress, in front of a commissioning uh, committee of Congress, speaking to mm -hmm. them and to the world, to the American public on the record in a public hearing seems to me a much more weighty undertaking than speaking to a, mm -hmm. a journalist. I mean, I, I, I'm glad yeah. we, we will talk about how we had to coax Dave into doing this, but um, mm -hmm. I would think that you would consider that to be significant. I don't know if you've been asked to do that yet, but would you if you were asked? Oh, of course. If I was asked, oh, yeah, I definitely would. Um, I have not been, um, so I'll just kind of just, you know, go about my day. But, uh, um, I, yeah, I'd be interested to see how Dave got roped into this and how how he uh, um, you know, said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, but he, he's I mean, very, he's again, very mad at me right now. He's very mad at me. Yeah. I, I coax him into it. Okay. Well, you know, that's on you there, buddy. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, I think you've, you've talked to myself and Dave enough to know that if anything, we're underplaying it, you know, what we, what we saw and recorded, um, you know, neither of us are the embellishing type of people. Um, and what he says, I mean, that guy knows more about that aircraft than, you know, probably the entire air wing put together. I mean, he, he knows everything about every system. He's been, he's a top gun pilot. He knows tactics. Um, I mean, he's the commanding officer of a super hornet squadron. You just don't, they just don't hand those jobs out, you know, willy nilly. You gotta, you gotta earn that. And, uh, so he's a, he's a very good representative for this, uh, this, these hearings, but, uh, I, I know there's, there had to have been a reluctance of like, God, dang it, you know, like <laughs> I guarantee it. Oh, I'm, I'm getting the brunt of that now. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, look, he knows that it's important on a much bigger level. And I kind of want to yeah. just touch on that with you in our in our private mm -hmm. conversations. You're you're very open with me. And actually, we recorded that where we don't know what it is. But how mm -hmm. do you you know, how do you view this? Like, how do you bring this into your life? You know that you saw something and filmed something that is unlike what we have. I mean, you used stronger mm -hmm. words privately. Can you just tell me how you assimilate this information from what you saw and you experienced now? What does this mean to you that you saw something that, that you can't do in the sky? Yeah, that's that that that's the kind of thing that, you know, once once these uh, uh, things started to resurface, you know, a few years back, um, I started thinking about it more and more. And, you know, I was on the phone with Dave and a couple of the other players that were involved. Um, at least on the Nimitz encounter. And uh, we kind of revisited that from like, you know, trying to put ourselves back into that headspace. And because, you know, it had been so long, um, relatively speaking. And uh, it's just, it's it's a little surreal, but it's, um, I'm glad it's being acknowledged. And I'm glad to be quite honest that the, the East Coast guys got their footage as well, because it just, it makes you know, all these things like, and you can see these, these recordings and these testimonies are, are kind of ramping up in detail um, based off of, you know, cause uh, I know some of the East coast guys, you know, they, they were seeing these things on the daily, you know, they, this wasn't just a, you know, a, a, a one shot thing, you know, like this is our one opportunity to kind of, you know, validate this whole thing. I mean, they were seeing these things every day. They're I guess they were falling around the the battle group, and that's very odd. Um, and and kind of, but you know, thinking back now, it's like, well, I guess what I did see was was kind of important and deserves the attention that is that has been getting. And so I I think it's really cool. I think it needs to be done. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing both what what your yeah and George what your guys' feedback is of how it goes and you know kind of some you know discussions you had maybe off the record with uh, you know just kind of shooting the bull of you know how 
you know, the questions that were being asked and stuff like that. And um, you'll be getting FaceTime videos from us for sure. I, I, I don't doubt that. I don't, I don't doubt that. I always bro. send you videos, but, right? No. Um, hey, look, yeah. man, brass tax it with me. You know, this is not like, you know, this is not like on the record. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, we're filming, but what do you think it is that you saw if you had to guess? Well, just quite simply, it was an object that I couldn't identify. And we're, tr we're very highly trained to, to be able to identify those things down to the, you know, at 20 miles away, I should be able to tell if it's a 737, a 747, another, another military aircraft, a, a helicopter of some sort. We're, tr we're trained to do that stuff every single day, multiple times a day. And, um, the way this thing was behaving just kind of just, you know, after ruling out what I'm like, well, it could have been this because it would have exhibited this type of, you know, it didn't, there's no heat source. So it couldn't be just propelling itself. Maybe it was doing it magnetically, you know, it was maybe using some sort of other dimensional kind of thing that we certainly don't have yet. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, I really have no idea is the bottom line, you know, and I'm not going to, I don't want to sit here and guess and be like, you said, you know, I don't want, I don't want those figures kind of coming back at me. But um, I, I honestly, I, I've never, even to my own family, I've never really said, I have, I have no idea what it is. You know, I, I have, you know, I have no reason to guess. Yeah, I, I'm, I can guess all I want and got to go through different scenarios in my own headspace, but I just kind of leave it at that. You know, if it's something like if, you know, if a light bulb goes off and you're like, aha, it was, it had to have been this or that, or, you know, something like that, then that would be something a little bit different, but it's never really gotten to that. Point. Wouldn't it be neat if a journalist exactly like George Knapp had, let's say a huge document detailing a lot of the blind spots that you might have just being the man that filmed the Tic Tac UFO, mm -hmm. an intelligence mm -hmm. report. George, would someone like you have something like that? I wish I could get a hold of that because if I did, I'd, I'd probably share it. With you know? who? Yeah. Congress, for one, I, I would think, you know. Anyway, um, I have one other question, Commander Underwood. Um, you know, we get mixed signals from you, your fellow aviators. We know that those guys on the mm -hmm. East Coast were seeing these things every day for a while. We know about the West Coast mm -hmm. events, both in 04 and 2019. We hear reports mm -hmm. about other incidents, but that naval aviators, Air Force pilots, uh, contrary to the statements out of the Department of Defense that we want transparency, we want reporting, that they're not sending that stuff up the chain of command because A, they don't wanna have an eight hour debriefing, so they destroy any videos or images that they or data that they collect. Mm. They don't want to have it on their record. They're not convinced that whistleblowers are protected. So I'll, there are a lot of incidents. As you said, there are sensors that are way more sensitive than they were back in 2004 that are picking these things mm. up, but the public isn't seeing it. Can you address that, what you hear from the your um, fellow aviators? That's a, that's a close-knit world about what's being seen yeah. and how the evidence is being handled and whether we actually have transparency from our government or not. Some of the guys that may still be on active duty might be, they're going to be more reluctant just to come forward with what they know because they're, they're speaking for the Navy. You know, when you put on a uniform and testify um, to Congress, like you're a representative of the Navy or Air Force or what have you. People don't want to, people, I could easily see where people don't want to, you know, torpedo what could be a, a, a commanding officer tour because have it stop, you know, hit that roadblock in their record when it gets reviewed. Oh, they, this guy must be out of his, he must have be a little nutty because in 2019, he recorded this and, you know, report, you know, it, it, I, I can easily see where there could be some reluctance. Um, I never really had any intention of becoming a commanding officer. So I, I was just like, Ah, I'll share. I don't know. What do I care? You know, like I'm going to retire. I'm retired now anyway. So it's just, you know, even back then I was, I was a little bit leery of sharing everything that I had because I had a fear of I was speaking for the government because I was still earning a paycheck from them. But now it's just, you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I'll, I'll share my opinion when asked, but um, 
I do kind of worry about the whole whistleblower thing. I mean, you're supposed to be protected. You know, that's that's those acts were passed way a lot of years ago. Why are you worried about that? Well, it's just in the in the past couple. I mean, they're not necessarily have to be related to UAPs. It's just whistleblowing in general. I'd like to see more active care taken towards the UAP occurrences specifically and make sure that those the the people that are uh, that are talking about these and the, what other uh, you know what other folks are out there that maybe holding their cars to the best that they don't want to be known for that yeah. um you know or or blowing the whistle they just want to kind of move on with their careers and lives and stuff like that i i can understand that i can see both sides of it but um i just you know i, I just hope that there's there's no ramifications to people's careers and um blowback and things like that 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 would just suck you know that would if anything it'd be hurtful to the 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 people that have come out and and given their testimonies in the future you know so it's only going to make the you know they're going to hold those cards even tighter and i don't that's not right right so you want to protect the people that have come forward treat them right so with david grush coming forward now People like that should be able yeah. to, to tell what they have to tell. They've done everything right. We should protect them. Mm -hmm. We should treat them right. Otherwise, you're going to have problems in the future where people that really need to blow the whistle on something, that they're going to fear the reprisal. So how we treat David Grush at this moment is how the world and our military and our DOD and our Pentagon is going to treat other people that have valuable information to bring forward. So we got to treat them right. Congress mm -hmm. is moving forward. You're going to have hearings this week. Your friend Dave Fravor yeah. will be one of the first witnesses, mm -hmm. you know, and they're preceding yeah. um, all the discussion that about UFOs, UAP for the past five and a half years have focused on uh, the yeah. main issues, aviation safety, national security, yeah. and then, you know, mm -hmm. satisfying public curiosity. What the heck are there? We all want to know. Do you believe mm -hmm. that these inquiries that are now underway are legitimate, that we really should dig in deeper to find out for national security reasons, aviation safety? And general curiosity. I'm glad they're happening. I I, I root I root all those on because if you hold, it it takes the folks like yourselves and and Dave and the other players in that event to hold the you know hold the Pentagon and the Congress's feet to the fire and be like, you guys are going to drop this case if we don't keep pursuing it and we're not going to give up. You know, uh, I'll throw Lou Alzando in the mix there too is one of the very key players, Chris Mellon and things like that. You know, it's I'm glad. Their their feet are been being held to the fire, and I have two friends that are on um, the House of Representative. One of one of which was in my sister squadron at the time, and the other one was uh, well, both of them were in my air wing. So I, I know them both. They're both in the House of Representatives now, and so it's if there are questions that need to be asked about, okay, this is what you're, you know, they can go to these committees, what subcommittees, and give a give the person who doesn't have any experience with this kind of stuff of, okay, this is, this is what happened. This is what this is as an aviator slash member of Congress. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool too. Um, from the uh, safety standpoint. Uh, yes, of course it is a safety of flight issue. And I, I'm a aviation safety officer um, kind of collaterally. So that's important to me uh, for obvious reasons. You know, we don't want to just, you know, hit something inadvertently that's out there in the same piece of sky that shouldn't be there. Um, public curiosity. I'm also glad uh, that there's there's a press on that as well. And um, I think that these objects should be considered unclassified. Um, at least the FLIR footage. You know, the radar stuff is a little. You can kind of get into some uh, some mucky waters there because of uh, how they can be exploited by. Um, nations of other nations of interest. Um, uh, but I'll tell you this in my experience, at least in the aviation side of things, when it comes to classifying something, the Pentagon is very kind of spring loaded to consider it classified until there's a valid reason that it shouldn't be. And they're just kind of, they kind of classify it as a, uh, you know, secret or, or higher by default, you know, and when they when they really shouldn't be, I mean, there's nothing on that FLIR pod that on my footage that is classified in any means. Um, there just isn't, you know, the radar tapes a little bit different. 
but there's there's the, that's the reason why we're not seeing those in public. Um, but the FLIR the FLIR stuff declassify that. Let, let's because this is not just a military thing. Yes, it is kind of. I guess it is a national security issue. I mean, what isn't? You know, it's. But it's if these things are real and legitimate and being found, West Coast, East Coast, you know, uh, in and around uh, places of nuclear uh, uh, center points, you know, uh, missile silos, carrier air, you know, things that are nuclear operated, submarine, you know, nuke subs, and things that are associated with kind of nu the nuclear power side of things. That's that that would make my my ears perk up a little bit and be like, oh, that's kind of dangerous. You know, they're not just sightseeing, they're kind of taking a look at something. I'm interested to hear like how everything goes because I'm sure they're what are you guys, I don't know what your you guys have clearances or anything like that if you're going to be going to okay. So there I don't know if there's going to be other um you know subcommittee hearings, you know, that are that are private, you know. Yeah, we'll talk about required. we'll talk about that kind of not on our show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Commander Underwood, thanks very much. Chad, see, see you got person soon. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, we got to have Anytime. we got to have you out, man, to, to LA to do a, a you know, kind of round up before we end our show, about 20 more episodes yeah. in person cuz it would be great to bear hug you, man. Yeah, thanks, that'd Chad. be awesome. Thank you. Anyway, man, I'm looking forward to it. I think the world is going to learn a lot more from this. This is the start, not the end. You know, this is where we begin is hearing directly for the first time in history and in the congressional setting from direct firsthand witnesses. I am so glad so far this has worked out in the next 24 hours. We'll know. Yeah. If everything goes well, a credible testimony, the committee is happy, then there could be more of these hearings and we can dig a little bit further into it uh, the next time. The committee and other members of Congress can dig into it. Hopefully the Senate's going to do something like this as well. Um, and, and also hopefully those two houses can work together in, in actually making transparency on the UAP issue something real instead of just something that people talk about and pay lip service to. And I'm, I think Apollo, the boy cat, agrees with me back there. He's telling me he's going to get an agent after all this exposure on the show today. And I hope you don't mind. Yeah, your famous cat, Apollo. Apollo's head can't get bigger than Freya's head because Freya was on CNN. That's right. That's true. Anyway, this was a cool episode. Hope I get to see you in Washington. Hopefully I can be there and we'll we'll find out real soon. Never have so few had so much to tell, but could say so little. Following this is the weaponized presentation of Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, Dark Horse Entertainment, and Cadence 13 Studios. Available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.